Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Betting Life Podcast, brought to you by Fantasy Life and powered by our friends at Unabated. I'm Matthew Freeman, Matt F. The Oracle. We are into week three and here to talk a little Thursday night football and give his favorite bets. For the week three slate is sports speculator savant Peter Jennings, aka CSU Ram 88 of Unabated. Peter, we have a guest with us tonight. You know him from his work at CBS Sports. You can hear him on the Pick Six podcast. If you are watching on YouTube, which I definitely think that you should hit that like and subscribe button. You can see that he has a face that some might describe as quote unquote, very punchable. <laughs> I'm talking about Will Brinson. Will, welcome to the show. What's up, fellas? How we doing? Pumped to be with y'all. Uh, former notary, very punchable face. And I'm sorry, Peter, but kind of a Deion Sanders fan. Um, I know that that's not a popular opinion. Uh, and, 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 and look, I, that was an incredible game. I think I heard you talking about it, so I don't want to continue discussing it since I I heard you discussing it elsewhere. Um, but uh, like the game was insane, and like I, I kind of love what Dion's doing for like just that that whole school. Even though you're they're your rival, I, if he came to if he came to Chapel Hill, I like I, I lose sleep every night thinking about the idea of him coming to Chapel Hill and coaching the Tar Heels. Uh, I love Dion. Uh, Coach Prime's the, the man. Uh, I was fortunate to have lunch with him. He's an Ooh. amazing guy. And I actually root for CU football, even maybe a little bit more than CSU. Uh, I'm spending spending time more time there. But, yeah, it was a great game. Uh, I unfortunately had the under and uh, the, the Rams in the second half and the under uh, in that game. So that was the most tilted I've been in a while from a sports betting perspective. I cannot believe the Rams didn't go for it on fourth and two on the CU 40 college football. That college football unders are, are trash so with their, with their overtime. The overtime rules shouldn't count for college football unders. It's absolute trash. It was, it was crushing, but uh, yeah, coach prime is killing it. And uh, I mean, what a cool comedy made to, um, I don't know. I posted on Twitter. It was kind of going viral. Just, Giving forgiveness for the the hit that the CSU player put on uh, Travis Hunter is is a good thing, but yeah, uh, excited for college football. But I know we're we're chat- chatting NFL, so excited to get in with you guys. All right, well let's uh, let's start here with Thursday night football. You have the Giants on the road uh, playing the 49ers. They are on back to back road games out west, so they stayed out west, uh, but they are fairly banged up. This number is 10, 10 and a half across the market. Pete, I want to start with you. Anything that you see in terms of the larger markets, the side total money line, anything like that stand out to you? Yeah, I, I tend to like the under here. Uh, there's some 44 and a halfs out there. Um, in general, Thursday night is lower scoring. And I do think that the path for the Giants to try to keep this game close is going to be running the football, uh, which will kill the clock. So I broadly like unders. The market has adjusted. There used to be pretty much value always on the under on Thursday night football and, and they have moved the totals down, but I do think this is a pretty good spot, especially given uh, the giants game plan should be to run the football and San Francisco hasn't been that good against the run. So I, I'm hoping that'll be kind of the game plan and the under is a good bet here. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, I wouldn't, opinion. I wouldn't have a problem yeah. with the under at all. I mean, I think you look at like, there's, there's just multiple paths to get there, right? Where you look at week one, San Francisco comes out with a dominant defensive effort, puts the locks on, on Pittsburgh and wins 30 to seven. Uh, if, if you get an early San Francisco lead, it's been interesting to see the usage there with Kyle Shanahan and Christian McCaffrey in the sense that like, they've kind of, I mean, like he's seeing like snap rates that he saw in 2019 that Ron Rivera, you know, Ron Rivera was given him because Ron thought he was going to get fired or knew he was going to get fired and, and was just willing to sort of run, run McCaffrey into the ground. Um, I'm going to go with, I mean, I'm going to be pretty chalky on this game, I think, but I want to go with the Niners. Look, the Giants aren't very good. I think Brian Dable is a top 10 coach in the NFL. I think Daniel Jones gets better in his second year eventually. But if you see the injury report, I mean, they, they ruled out Andrew Thomas out, Saquon Barkley's out. I mean, they don't they don't come back against the Cardinals if Saquon Barkley isn't in that game. He played really well in the second half. Um, you know, I, I think you're going to see this this Niners defense just swarm to Daniel Jones. No Andrew Thomas. You know, I think they're missing multiple linemen. This like the, like Javon Hargrave. You add him to this defensive line. Like these guys are loaded on the defensive line, and they're going to get tons of pressure. They're going to run the football a bunch. They're going to force Daniel Jones into a bunch of dropbacks. And I think they'll probably play some zone on the back end to make sure he doesn't take off running and then just drop in and, and pick him off a couple of times. Maybe one goes to the house. I think the Niners, like 10 points is a lot in the NFL, but I think the Niners win by double digits pretty comfortably here. 
All right. Well, you and I are going to be on opposite sides here. And I, I got to say, I don't feel good about it because everything you said is correct. The, <laughs> the Giants are totally beat up. If you look at the people they're missing, obviously Saquon Barkley, I mean, he's the apparent one, but yeah, they're missing the left side of their offensive line, left tackle, Andrew Thomas, uh, their left guard, uh, Ben Bredenson. Uh, they're missing one of their top edge rushers in Aziz Ojolari. And I'm skeptical that uh, one of their main off-ball linebackers, Micah McFadden, I'm skeptical that he's going to play. I'm also skeptical that wide receiver Wandell Robinson is going to play. Uh, but even with all of those things factored in, I still have the Giants just on the other side of 10. So there are some 10 and a halfs where you can get this. I have this projected at 9.8. So I think there's value in going through the key number here. And for me, the, the kind of the handicapping aspect of this, not really thinking about the number, but like the matchup is that, yeah, Saquon Barkley, his absence will be noticed, but backup Matt Breida, like he's fine. He's a competent fill-in. He's got the hashtag revenge game. Not that that means anything, but it's fun to mention. And I think the Giants are going to utilize their effective ground game. They're number four in rush success rate. And that I think has more to do with the scheme than with Saquon Barkley. He's more of a, a boom or bust kind of runner. I think they're going to try to grind the clock down, shorten the contest against the 49ers defense that is kind of surprisingly underwhelmed against the run. Uh, through two games, they've been number 30 in rush success rate. So it's not like they're allowing a lot of opponents to get massive chunk gains against them, but they are allowing opponents to get positive runs almost every time they decide to run the ball. So I think this is a disgusting game that I don't really want to watch, uh, especially given the side that I'm going to be backing. But I think it's a kind of hold your nose type of play uh, with me going for the Giants at plus 10 and a half. Uh, let's look at the prop market here. Uh, and I, I want to start, Will, with you. CMC, you're going over 79 and a half rushing yards. And I got to say, I, I like this one because I do think CMC is going to absolutely dominate. He's been dominant to this point, leads the league in carries, leads the league in rushing yards. He is getting that old school type of usage hammering the over on Christian McCaffrey there. I mean, the the human corpse that is James Conner strolled out against the Giants last week and carried the ball 23 times for 106 yards. Like, Christian McCaffrey is playing... If you put, if you gave Kyle Shanahan the ability to create a, like a, a human being, like designed to, to work in his offense, non-quarterback version, obviously, um, like, a, like a skill position guy... He would think about George Kittle. He might, I mean, George Kittle would be up there. He'd think about Devo Samuel, but the guy he'd create is Christian McCaffrey, like from a mental and physical skill set. Like McCaffrey, McCaffrey showed up on three days, three days. He was traded three days later. He's on the field playing well for the 49ers in limited snaps. And now he has a full offseason immersed in Kyle Shanahan's system, which, like, you know, I mean, his, you know, the, the connections with Mike and his dad and, and, and Kyle, like, very apparent, very, very worn out. But, like, this Giants team isn't going to stop the run. Dexter Lawrence, one of my favorite prospects in, in, in like, he's straight, he's like North came just North of here, but like Chris McCaffrey is going to, he's going over a hundred yards in this game. I don't really understand what the prop number is unless like there's two defensive scores. Purdy throws a bomb to, or like Purdy throws a, a short pass to Debo Samuel who rips off a touchdown. And then they put in Elijah Mitchell and decide just to not run Christian McCaffrey. Like that is kind of my biggest fear about him not going over the 78, 79 and a half, whatever it is. Yeah, well, you and I are, are correlated here because I'm taking the under on Elijah Mitchell's mm. uh, 28 and a half rushing yards. Uh, I have this projected at 21.4. So uh, I think it's a Christian McCaffrey kind of game. And this this you know goes along with the idea that I like the Giants. I think this game stays a little bit closer, which means more opportunities for McCaffrey, fewer opportunities for Mitchell. Uh, Pete, what is the prop that you are looking at right now? Yeah, a little bit of a head shirt. I, I agree that I'm hoping the Giants keep it close, and I do think they'll they'll run the ball. But Matt Breed is a decent uh, receiver out of the backfield. He's gotten a bunch of targets in the past, had an eight-target game last year. Uh, didn't, didn't convert it into many yards, but I'm still going to go over 12 and a half uh, receiving yards. Basically, with the spread, you know, generally that's a good thing for, for running backs uh, from a receiving side. I like to take unders generally, but I, I do think Matt Breed will be involved in the passing game. And uh, 12 and a half yards seems pretty reasonable. Uh, some projections I've looked at are kind of that 14, 15 yard range. 
Uh, so it's not a slam dunk, but it, it's a decent one. All right. So the, uh, the bets that I mentioned, I have in the 100% free bet tracker at fantasy life. You can find everything there. Uh, all of our bets for the week. Let's get to the best bets. And uh, Pete, I want to start with you. I see that you're looking at the Buccaneers. Uh, I, I have some regret that I didn't grab this number at six and a half early in the week. I was showing value on it and I was getting greedy, hoping that it would hit seven and it went the opposite direction. What do you see with this game? Yeah, uh, fortunate to hit some of those numbers, not for much. Obviously, it's easier to find some inefficiencies early in the week. Uh, some sharp groups definitely on the Bucks at the six and a half number. Um, that wasn't originally my play, but I, I still like it. And just after doing some more research, I think this this game should be around four. Uh, I think that's an appropriate line. The Eagles have just had so many injuries uh, across the board, uh, specifically on defense. And the Bucks have been overperforming. Baker looks pretty good in this offense. And at home here, uh, I just think the Eagles uh, are a little bit overrated. So I still like the Bucks plus five. I think this line will probably close in the four and a half to four range, which is where I have it. And uh, yeah, there's some fives out there, but a lot of the market is moving to four and a half already. And I wouldn't be surprised to see fours uh, sooner rather than later. So uh, at five, I think there's still a little bit of value left on the bone here. Yeah, I have this projected at 4.6. So I, you know, I think it will probably settle right in that range. Uh, will, what are you looking at for your first best bet? So, I mean, I, I kind of, I think that as of right now, this would, like, I, I really like the Rams on Monday night. Um, I think that the, I'm going to go with the Falcons as my actual best bet. The Falcons plus three and a half at the, at the lions. Um, but like, I, I just want to make a note that because the Rams are on Monday night, it feels like Joe Burrow as of, so as of Tuesday, it felt like Burrow wasn't going to play the line moved four points. It's kind of, seems like it's shifting a little bit towards he might play. The only reason I think the Rams are going to win the game outright. So I don't really care what the number is. I mean, obviously I do care what the number is, but like if Burrow plays, I think it probably closes like. Bengals minus four if he's banged up at a game time decision. So I don't want to bet it now if it's starting to trend towards Burrow playing. I think if Burrow is out for that game, then the Rams are going to be favored. So I'm in, I'm interested in getting the Rams at, you know, I would like to get a three, obviously, um, now. And then you, you know, when that news happens, like there's buzz out there that Burrow might miss a couple of weeks. And I, I don't know how serious that is. I just think like the Bengals paid him a ton of money. They're 0 and 2. You can't rush him out there and keep doing that. And, and I think Stafford is, you know, we talked about before the show, like I think the Rams have looked really good. Aaron Donald's a problem for that offensive line. And Matthew Stafford uh, playing good, really good football. But for the Falcons, like the Falcons and the Lions are going to play a bunch of games that are really close all season long. Uh, Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot essentially created Tennessee light. Like B. John Robinson is not Derrick Henry, but he's like, uh, probably a generational talent at running back. I mean, did you see that the view from up top that they the, the Falcons tweeted out where he's just like he's like it looks like he's on like horizontal roller skates, like 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 going around these Packers defenders. It's ridiculous. Uh, Desmond Ritter's playing better football than he's probably being given credit for. Kyle Pitts and Drake London, uh, yes, fantasy owners want to gouge their eyes out, but like they are capable, you know, like really elite you know, options if the Falcons are trailing. And Detroit, to me, is like their defense got better, but Chauncey Gardner-Johnson's on IR. They're pretty banged up. And they're just going to be in these games where, just like last year, they're going to be really close, except now the difference is, guys, like instead of being a three-point dog at home to a good football team that's 2-0, and oh, the Lions are a three-and-a-half-point favorite at home. And we saw what they did with Seattle, like – you can get moving on Detroit. I think you can sling the ball around. I don't know how high scoring this will be, but I think if you're giving me, if this is flipped in Atlanta, Detroit's getting three and a half. I take Detroit. I just think both of these teams will be involved in very, very, a lot of very, very close games. I'm with you. I have a position on this, uh, Atlanta, Atlanta plus three and a half, Wish I had bet it a little bit earlier, but, uh, I I'm there with you. And I, I mean the three and a half, I think that's the number that matters there. And yeah, yeah, the Falcons, as you mentioned, I think they're going to be in a lot of close games. I think the Lions aren't uh, the type of team that is really equipped to play as a favorite of more than three points. Um, so Fal Falcons, yeah, de Falcons defense is good, yeah. by the way. Like they added some guys up front, and, like some veteran guys, like Clayus Campbell, David Animata. Like they are, a, and, and Jesse Bates on the back end. It, this, this is a better Falcons defense than people think. Uh, I agree with that. All right. So my 
first best bet. It's it's disgusting. Uh, I I hate talking about it, but uh, I'm going to Cardinals plus twelve and a half uh, hosting the Cowboys. Um, again, this is a this is a game I wouldn't watch. I think it will be terrible. Uh, I probably wouldn't bet this uh, until closer to kickoff uh, because I could see the line moving a little bit more towards the Cowboys um, who have been awesome, right? Like there's no denying that the Cowboys have been awesome. They've scored more points and allowed fewer points than any other team in the league, but the Cardinals have been feisty. Uh, they've been competitive. You know, they lost in weeks one and two, but they covered in both of those weeks uh, despite entering the season as the presumed worst team in the league. And they have, you know, one professional player on their <laughs> offense, James Conner. I don't know if we can even say that he's good, but he's at least a professional running back in the year 2023. And I expect the Cardinals are going to give him as much work as he can handle and use him to attack a Cowboys run defense that has been good at limiting big plays. Uh, they're number one in rush EPA, but they've consistently allowed positive plays, number 23 in rush success rate. So I think the Cardinals are going to use a run heavy attack uh, and use that to try to slow the game down just enough to get the cover. I mean, 12 and a half is a lot of points. And I mentioned this in the Monday uh, betting life newsletter. 0 and 2 underdogs are 59, 42 and 2 against the spread over the past 20 years. You know, I think it's just a good situational buy low spot for a team that uh, has not like given up like a team that has actually shown the propensity to put up some fight. So uh, it feels disgusting, but I think that there is some value on this position. And uh, I have this projected closer to 10. So uh, I, I don't know if I would be betting it all the way to 10, but I, I do think that there is some value here in this position. All right, Pete, I want to kick it back to you. Uh, what is your second best bet here? Yeah, going to go over 48 in the Miami-Denver game. Uh, Denver's defense outside of Sertain has not been impressive. I think Miami's going to have a ton of overs this year in general. New England obviously didn't push them, and um, that was kind of an ugly game. New England does have a really strong defense. And I was optimistic a little bit about Denver uh, getting Judy back. Russell Wilson actually made some really good deep ball throws, and I just see the potential for a lot of big plays here. Uh, I have this game around 49 and a half, uh, so there's still some 48s out there. It's kind of trending towards 48 and a half. Uh, broadly like unders and underdogs, but uh, this is an over that I think is uh, a decent spot uh, that should show some value. And I think in general, the Dolphins are going to, you know, they're going to be in a lot of high scoring games. Uh, and we're seeing that already in the totals for the Dolphins. But uh, this is one where I, I expect it to kind of move up throughout the Doesn't this, doesn't this uh, Broncos team have a feel of like, remember when Sean Payton and Drew Brees went seven and nine in like three straight years and Brees was setting every passing record every year. And it's like, they're still seven and nine. And then Sean Payton showed up to the owner's meetings and they're like, Hey, Sean, you, you've gone seven to nine, like three straight years. He's like, I've got a contract extension in my pocket right now. He's like, do me pull it out and sign it. Everybody was like, Whoa, dude, like just settle, settle down, buddy. It's a little aggressive. Um, I would go with Mike Vrabel as a dog. Come on. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't, I mean, I don't know how many times people have to make this guy an underdog for him. And like he covers it. I think it's either 57 or 58% of the time as an underdog Titans plus three at uh, Cleveland. Cleveland loses Nick Chubb. Deshaun Watson looks terrible. I mean, he doesn't look good right now. Uh, the Titans can get pressure on the interior with, you know, Jeffrey Simmons. I think you flush Deshaun Watson out. You and like the whole idea that Kevin Stefanski was going to re, re like, like re-engineer his offense to work around Deshaun Watson to be this pass heavy offense. That's cute and all, but Deshaun Watson doesn't work in structure the way that Kevin Stefanski wants. Kevin Stefanski wants a quarterback who does what they're supposed to do in the structure of his offense in a run heavy game. Kirk Cousins, right? Kirk Cousins is going to do what you tell him to do. He's going to do the smart thing. Deshaun Watson is going to bail on his reads. He's going to hold the ball, run around behind the line of scrimmage and try to make things happen and take a ton of sacks. And you saw it, it leads to turnovers. Now, I don't think the Titans, I think the Titans D is probably like league average, maybe a little bit better, but not as, I mean, it's not like, it's not like a top five unit or anything, but I mean, they're going to get after Watson. They're going to get him on the ground. He, he, if, go look at his next gen stats passing chart. It looks like they created extra markers down the sidelines because they can't chart how far out of bounds the passes went. They're just like, it's like 15 passes, like running along each sideline. He is, he's not, he's not back to where he was, or he's not playing the way he was in Houston 
or he is, but he's not playing it well. And it's it, this offense is incongruous with what Watson does as a player. Amari Cooper's banged up. So you're basically, you know, you've got Cooper. I thought he played well, but it's like Donovan Peoples-Jones, Elijah Moore, who, you know, targeted nine times, sailed over his head a bunch. And Jerome Ford's a, I, I picked him up in fantasy. I think he's going to be good. Kareem Hunt signed today. But, like, this running game was sort of the, the fulcrum point of this offense. And now they're going to have to lean on Deshaun Watson against a team that is going to pound the ball with Derrick Henry, who's, like, begging to pop off for a couple of big runs. I don't have a position on the side with this game. If if I were to take a side, honestly, it would be hard to say. I mean, I the, the Vrabel as a, an underdog thing, that always catches my eye. Uh, the position that I do have on this game is the total. Uh, I took under 41 and sure. a half. It's 39 and a half now. And, you know, I just think, you know, you mentioned Derrick Henry. Uh, I think the, the Titans are going to give him as much work as he can handle. Uh, but the, the Browns defense... It's been pretty good. Like that's the one like lone part of this, sure. uh, this team that you could point to and say like, Hey, that is really good. And then on the flip side, I agree with you that we are still going to see uh, a Browns team that wants to try to run the ball. And they're running into the teeth of a Titans defense. That is one of the best against the run in the league. And, you know, to me, that just kind of screams under, but that correlates with your bet. You know, like if you like the under, uh, I think that breeds a, a kind of game state where we could see the Titans end up winning here. Uh, I have a, a similar kind of bet here. Uh, you know, you're going with the Titans in part because of Rabel and uh, just his wizardry as an underdog. I'm going with the Steelers. Uh, I got this at plus three. It's plus two and a half. I still like it fine at that number. Uh, I think that this is bettable you know around the pick em range i think the steelers should be favored in this spot and you know sunday night football on the road in las vegas the steelers have been terrible on offense like there's there's no point in trying to deny that and quarterback can you pick it is number 32 in uh espn's qbr uh offensive coordinator matt canada kind of amazing that he still has a job right all of those things are true but the offense has had two really tough matchups against the 49ers and the Browns. And that's not the case this week. The Raiders number 31 in defensive EPA success rate and DVOA. We're talking like one of the stone cold worst defenses in the league. And the Steelers have a chance to get going in this spot. And then defensively, like we know what they can do. Like they are good enough to keep their offense in this game. And then finally, I think just the coaching difference. I, I think there's a massive Delta between what the Steelers have and Mike Tomlin, uh, who I have ranked as the number three head coach in the league in our, our fantasy life unit rankings and Raiders head coach, Josh McDaniels, who I have ranked number 26. Uh, you know, McDaniels is a good offensive mind. He is a terrible top down organizer for a franchise. Uh, I think under Tomlin, the Steelers have a significant edge and as an underdog, you know, 54, 31 and four against the spread. Like he always makes sure that his team is ready to compete when they are dogs. So uh, it's disgusting, but I do like the Steelers in this spot. Uh, I think there's going to be a bounce back for their offense. All right, Pete, uh, I want us to talk about bets that we haven't made yet, but that we are thinking about making or like games situations that have our attention. Uh, and you are looking at the Vikings game here. Yeah, there's some alternative lines. And again, uh, something that's so important is just shopping for the best price. And uh, I saw this earlier. I'm not sure it's there today, but uh, I, or I'm not sure it's still there now. Uh, but I saw under 48 and a half plus 203 on the, the total for the Vikings game. And obviously, this is expected to be high scoring. It's going to be a super relevant game for DFS. A lot of people are going to be targeting it. But you can get some big plus numbers on some still pretty high totals. So I'm going to be shopping around to see if I can find some interesting unders there. Uh, obviously, I see a lot of ways that this this is going to be a high scoring game, but uh, in the event that it kind of gets mucked up a little bit, uh, I'm going to try to find some of these totals where I can get some big plus money. So that that stood out as a big edge uh, in our concierge uh, on the edge rusher uh, on unabated. So I put it down and I'll continue to kind of shop to see if I can find some some big plus numbers on some unders for for this game. Yeah. Um... I know it's like that is going to be the absolute stone cold chalk in DFS, like. Like the like the number of like oh, yeah. cousins and Herbert stacks like or Herbert bring back and with Jefferson and it's 
it's like too good to be true. I think, I mean, just to your point, Peter, like I think the, the, like the, it's like, everyone's like, this game's going to be crazy. It's like, yes, it is. But it can also be like crazy where there's like five turnovers in the red zone. And like, you know, like, like dumb, like dumb stuff that both of these dumb teams do. Like it's going to come down to a, a, like a 72 yard field goal attempt at the end of regulation for sure. But like, it could be total dumb, dumbness. So I, I like, I think that's probably a good look, especially with it up to like 54, which is just silly in 2023. Um, I'll go with the Seahawks. And I've been, I meant actually like literally meant to have my uh, finger on the trigger during Monday night football. If the Panthers offense looked like crap. And to pull to pull on the four and a half, uh, it's up to five. It's probably up to six now. Maybe I think I put it in on Sportsline um, at five and a half, uh, and and got a little bit of it. But I I, I should have been more aggressive. Bryce Young now has a bum ankle. I and people will be like, "Well, are we sure that's not a good thing?" Maybe Andy Dalton's a little bit better. No, this offensive line is giving up tons of pressure. Um, Andy Dalton under pressure, very bad. This offensive line is built to run block. They're from my from my alma mater, NC State, uh, Icky Aquano and, and Chandler Zavala. Like th- this is not a this is not a pass blocking offensive line right now. They cannot threaten you down the field at all. I think until that final drive where they had that garbage time t- quasi garbage time touchdown, the longest play of the season was 15 yards. DJ Chark and Jonathan Mingo Mingo's looks raw. Chark is you know banged up. Those are their deep threats. Thielen is the guy that gets his offense going with Bryce Young. And Miles Sanders, and like they're just they can't attack you downfield. Defenses will close in, press the line of scrimmage, and force them to run. And Carolina's defense, Brian Burns is banged up. Uh, they just this defense can hold teams for a little bit, but not long enough to really slow them down. I think I think the Geno Smith we saw in Week Two is closer to. I think we'll see like maybe like that's three. That's like closer like an average or something. Like Geno Smith Week One is not the Geno Smith of that we'll see all season long. I think they can do damage against this Panthers defense, and uh, Seattle could blow out a Carolina team that is kind of reeling right now and can't get anything going on offense, even in Monday Night Football at home. Yeah, Seattle now six in the market, and uh, it'll be interesting to see where where it goes from here. Uh, we talked about this game earlier, uh, the Rams Bengals. Uh, you know, two two and a half across the market. Uh, the Bengals are still favored. Uh, man, I mean, such an interesting game uh, with the line movement going from seven and a half and the look ahead to six and a half when it reopened to three and a half and then through the three approaching one uh, and then now back to two and a half. Um, so just waiting for some injury clarification with Joe Burrow, but you know, I'm of the opinion that this number has moved too far. Um, but yeah. of course, you know, Will, as you mentioned, if Burrow is out, uh, I don't know what's to keep the Rams from closing his favorites. You know, I, I think right. there's a good chance that happens. So uh, just kind of waiting to see how the injury situation shakes out. Um, all right. Contest. Uh, Pete, I know that you are in the, uh, the big one at DraftKings, the 50,000. Will, I don't know if you are in any contest, but uh, quickly, this is becoming the thing that I'm kind of like most interested in uh, throughout the, the season. Uh, you know, kind of thinking about the game theory of it. I mean, first, you just got to be in, situ- in a position to care about game theory, uh, right. which probably comes in a little bit later. But uh, Pete, what is uh, the one bet right now that you feel most confident about using in contest? And by the way, I should say the tool at Unabated uh, is a godsend. Uh, I think everyone should be checking this out. Um, I, I mean, I've been using it relying on it heavily uh and you know i'm happy nine and one in my my contest at DraftKings through two weeks uh pete what is the one bet that you feel most confident in right now yeah it's been fun the, the chalk has hit for sure the lines that have moved those have covered uh i mean they're eight and two or nine and one and basically i'm in mean, the 50k the 5k and then i threw a bunch in the 500 so right now it's returning pretty good money uh, unfortunately eight and two is in in fourth place and top three pay yeah. uh, in the 50k but uh yeah it's it's been the the, the big favorites have covered in carolina was so tilting i had saints minus three oh. uh as a regular bet and then a bunch of people took carolina plus three and a half uh for the pick'em contest so I, I was hoping the saints could hold on to a big cover there but Anyways, uh, right now, the best play looks like the Giants because you're getting 10 and a half. Um, you know, obviously, the lines come out today. So broadly, you're you're not going to see as much value. But as the lines update throughout the week uh, and we get more clarity, there'll be some, some big advantages. And, you know, you could look to like the, the Bengals game. I could easily see that. 
uh, being one spot that you want to hit either way, depending on the Burrow news. I kind of think Burrow's most likely to sit, but yep. we'll see what happens. Uh, but if I had to pick something right now, it would be the Giants at plus 10.5. Uh, yeah, I got- Pete, I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. with you there, Pete. Uh, Giants 10.5, that's mine as well. Uh, you know, the market is 10. Uh, and, you know, kind of looking at some of the various contests and the um, – the way that uh, we see ownership distributed across, uh, you know, underdogs tend to, I think, be undervalued in those contests or underrepresented uh, in, in the five picks that people make. And so I think there's value there. And then Pete, you mentioned before the value on Thursday night games uh, where, you know, sometimes people just want to oh, yeah. get their picks in. So I feel like we're hitting on a couple of different angles here with the Giants plus 10 and a half. So riding with you there, really like that one. Will, what do you like? Uh, so I'm going with the Patriots, and I, it looks like they're – are they popular? I'm actually surprised. I feel like most people have been on the Jets here um, or at least interested in fading. I think Patriots, what, 55%? Um, here's – I mean, and look, I'm not – I understand that the Jets, as a home dog, this should be a spot where I'm – with that Jets defense and the lack of weapons that the Patriots really have, this should be a spot to take the Jets. Like, I think the math – and the smart, like, like the, I think generally speaking, like the way that like, like smart people would approach and myself included, like the way you would approach, if like you just give me the resumes of these two teams, you're like, yes, I will take the home team catching two and a half in this spot. But <laughs> Bill Belichick is 0-2. The Patriots are 0-2 at home for the first time since 1975. Bill Belichick hates the Jets more than anything in life. I love the under in this game too. Like make it 28 if you want. Like I just don't, unless there's like three defensive touchdowns, I don't think it goes over. Belichick is going to tell Bill O'Brien that we are running the football and we are letting Mac Jones make like one, maybe two read throws as far away from Sauce Gardner as humanly possible, that we're going to get the ball out quickly and that we're going to punt as much as we need to. And that we're going to put the ball, not in Mac Jones's hands, but in Zach Wilson's hands. And let Zach Wilson f this up, and we're gonna pow, like crowd up at the line of scrimmage, and like stop them from running, and force Zach Wilson put send like Zach Wilson's career stats against Bill Belichick are horrendous. I think it's two touchdowns, seven picks. He is gonna let Zach Wilson lose this game. He will not go to zero and three, especially against the Jets. I know that Belichick is not in vogue again right now at the moment, but uh, I will back Belichick against the team he hates more than anything and a terrible quarterback and a bad offensive line. Love it. Love it. Will, is there anything that you want to plug, uh, you know, talking about all the work that you're doing throughout the week? Uh, yeah, I mean, Pick 6 Podcast on uh, YouTube, youtube.com slash NFL on CBS. We're there five days a week. Do recaps on Sunday nights as well. Uh, a bunch of written content on cbsports.com and uh, Twitter and Instagram at Will Brinson. All right. Awesome. Great stuff. Will, thanks for taking time to be with us on the show. Anytime. Best of luck to all of us as we move into week three. That is going to do it for this bets, this best bets episode of the Betting Life Podcast, powered by Unabated. Please subscribe to the show. Tell your degenerate betting friends. Join the Discord. See all of our bets in the free Fantasy Life Bet Tracker. And follow us on social media at CSE Ram88, at Will Brinson, and at Matt F. The Oracle. Thank you, and see you again next episode.